Psalms 103 verse 11 tells us that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love to those who fear Him. There's nothing to stop us from experiencing God's love and faithfulness. So let's just worship the Lord. Hallelujah. When I think about your goodness, my heart is overcome. How could I begin to thank you for everything you've done? Cause you keep on loving me and you cause my heart to see yeah. you. You make me come alive again. You, you make me come alive again. This is the moment, whoa, everything changes, whoa, you are my breakthrough, I praise you, I praise you. Stop singing and lifting up your name Cause you keep on loving me And it cross my heart to see yeah. You, you make me come alive again You, you make me come alive again I praise you Creation, 
keep singing oh there is no other you are forever lord over all there's nobody like you no one beside you to you let endless praise resound every night and day and with no delay let endless praise resound and to you let endless praise resound every night and day and with no delay let endless praise resound to you you up, 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 we're giving you our love, 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 for everything you've done, 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 oh, we give you all the praise, we lift you up, 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 we're giving you our love, 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 for everything you've done, 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 oh, we give you all the praise. Every night and day, and we know delay, let endless praise resound to you, to you. Let endless praise resound. Every night and day, and we know delay, let endless praise resound to you. you Lord Jesus thank you Lord for tonight and father we come before you we thank you that God you're going to just speak to us and to minister to us Lord you know tonight even as we are worshiping the Lord I know that there are some of us here or you may know someone who may be going through a crisis in their lives but you know what the the word of God tells us in 2nd Corinthians 12 9 that God's grace is more than sufficient for us so we may be going through the wilderness, but God is there. He will never leave us nor forsake us. So let's all just trust Him, put our hopes in Him, that we may be able to say, the Lord, whatever it is, it is well with my soul. Thank you, Lord. Our scars are a sign of grace in our lives. And Father, how you brought us through When deep were the wounds And dark was the night The promise of your love you proved Now every battle still to come Let this be a song it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Yes, Lord. Joy will paint the morning sky. You're there in the fast, you're there in the feast. Your faithfulness will always shine. Now every blessing still to come. Let this be a song. It is well. Your name. 
Habakkuk 3.17 tells us that though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes in the vines, the olive crops fail and the fields produce no food. There's no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stall. Yet, I will rejoice in you. I will take joy in God my Saviour tonight, that's what we want to do because the joy of the Lord is going to be your strength the joy of the Lord is going to be our strength and the Lord says that we may be knocked down but we will never be knocked out, God is always there to pull us up again and to lead us to the light at the end of the tunnel so let's take this time right now to just open up our mouths to just pray for yourself, to intercede to pray in tongues, to speak in tongues, and to receive the promises of God's Word, to receive His healing right now, to receive the light right now. Let the Lord speak to you. Let the Lord bring the breakthrough that you have been craving and you have been praying for. So let's just open our mouths right now. Kiri mbuti ana masde ti ana masanteri. Kuri ana masti pe pansi antara makura masanteri ana. Receive a breakthrough right now, Lord. Kiri ana masti di antara masti di ana kura masanteri. Thank you, Jesus. You light starlight in the dark. 
And endless smiles can conceal you And every glimmer is a spark And catching fire as you break through You're not far away, you're coming close. Oh, even as I wait, you're coming close. You're like summer in the night. Still I feel you And every shadow's turning bright And every broken heart is made new Oh, you're not far away You're coming close Even as I wait, you're coming close no heart unseen there's no space between you and I you and I you are closer than the very oxygen I'm breathing in oh I breathe you in you are God with us you are here with us, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. You are infinite, your glory has no end. Jesus,
catching fire as you break through. Well, over the next two weekends, I mean, this weekend and the next weekend, I, I want to be sharing something that I think it's, it's very relevant for us uh, in this season that we're going through with this whole uh, pandemic. And many of us, while things here in Singapore are kind of we're trying to move towards resuming things uh, as much as possible, but yet life is still very much different. A lot of us, we're still you know, working from home or having some arrangements where you're not at office all the time, but a lot of your work is being done at home. And so over these two weekends, I want to bring us two messages which I've called Finding Rest. Finding rest. And I'm going to be talking about it in, in two parts, uh, part one today and then next week will be part two. And uh, what we'll be looking at today is really the importance of finding rest. Why is it so important? And next weekend, we'll talk more on how we can go about finding that true rest in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I've actually shared on rest before and I think it's always important for us to talk about this regularly. Some of you, you're new here, you've never heard this message, but I think uh, it's good for you to know, and even if you've heard this before, it's an important reminder that we need to learn how to find rest. Why is this so important? Well, because we do live in a culture of busyness. That is how society is right now. That's our culture. A lot of things in our lives today encourages busyness. And if we're not very careful and we're not mindful about it, we can easily get swept up into this vortex of busyness. And it's a, it's a downward spiral. We just get caught up in, in one thing after another. We get busier and busier. And there are a number of things we can see in our culture today that leads us to that place. Um, one aspect, of course, people tend to get very busy with uh, their work, you know, their, their job, their careers. And sometimes we get so busy and caught up in that because we want job advancement or we want some sense of job security. And I've heard people share with me before how sometimes they feel the need to keep themselves extra busy at work so that they have a shot at career progression or so that they can even just keep their jobs. I mean, they've had bosses be that would say, you know, if you're not willing to do this, we've got 20 people outside waiting to do your job. People have heard this and because of that, they feel this endless need to need to do more so that they can keep their jobs or so that they can advance in their, their careers. I remember there's one time, it was a Saturday night, um, Serena and I were just driving down uh, the Central Business District and it was a Saturday night, it was about 11pm and we drive down there at CBD and we saw that there were people still working in their offices in the, in, in the, in the financial district, the high-rise uh, offices there. The lights were still on, people were still going about their business. It's a Saturday night, it's 11pm. But why? I, I feel like we have this culture of, of busyness where people must feel like, well, in this culture, we must constantly be working. Another reason is uh, given technology that we have today. You know, technology has changed so drastically over the last 20 years. And I do believe with better technology, we do actually see an increase in productivity. But it's also resulted in us becoming very much busier in our lives. You know, before there was the internet, before there were personal computing devices, uh, when you left the office, that was pretty much it. You pretty much left your work behind. Your work is pretty much at office. Sure, you can bring some of your work home, but there's only so much you can do. You're very much limited to what you can do at home. But today, I mean, let's not even talk about it. I mean, when I was growing up, there were, we were getting into the internet, computers, laptops, PDAs. Uh, remember, remember the days of Palm Pilots and, and all that? I mean, a, a lot of that was where we could start seeing our work coming to our homes. And now today, all right, our, our mobile phones alone, I mean, our mobile phones have so much computing power that they can do more than what some of the computers that, that I grew up with could, could actually do. We can respond to emails, we can make calls, video calls, spreadsheets, we can be connecting with people from different time zones in different places. And it makes work a lot easier. Things do get more and more, I mean, we are more productive because of that. But at the same time, it's a lot easier that we become busy as well. What more in this particular year? 
with this whole work from home arrangement with uh, things like Zoom, you know, telecommuting and, and all that. We're, we're even more connected than, than ever. And sometimes it feels very hard to shake this feeling that, that work is always looming around you. It's all over the place. You know, you could, be, you could be at home, you could be watching a movie with your family and suddenly your phone rings, you got to pick up a call from office or an email comes in and so on. Or you could be sick at home, you're down with the flu, but you're still getting phone calls, you're still getting assignments given to you and, and, and so on. I remember when, um, when, when I first started working, you know, I, and I first started working in the church, one of the first things I did was to get my email set up on my phone. And I was very excited about it because, you know, I, back then I got a smartphone. I'm back in the days where there was a physical keyboard and I was very happy. My phone actually had a QWERTY keyboard, a physical one on it. It was a work phone. I said, okay, I get my email set up on, on that. And uh, I was very happy because I could be looking at emails. I could be checking. It's very easy. I felt more productive. Uh, I think that lasted all of, um, I don't know, one or two months, you know. I did, I, after that, I kind of removed my email account from there. Why? Because... It kept haunting me, so to speak. I remember there was one time I was, I was, uh, I was out with Serena. I mean, we were dating at that point in time, and I got a notification, and an email came in, and and you know, you just see enough of the notification that you can see half of the email header. You can't see the entire him the email header, but you see a little bit of it, and you see enough of it that it piques your curiosity. Or not just that, you feel like you feel the need to find out what is this all about right now. And I remember I opened up the email, I read through it. It was not a very good email. It was about some situation that was going on. And the moment I read the email, that night was gone. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't enjoy that dinner, couldn't enjoy our time together because my mind just suddenly went elsewhere. I was, I was, I was just thinking about my work already. And these are just a few examples I want to show us about how, how our culture is like today, how we can end up becoming slaves to this aspect of work. We can just be caught up in this vortex of, of, of busyness. And I don't, I don't even know. Sometimes we reach a point where we feel like the, this whole idea of busyness is synonymous with being hardworking or being successful. That we must keep being busy in order to be, to be seen as successful or to be hardworking. And I, I, don't know, I don't know why we keep thinking about it. We feel like we must keep working harder and harder and harder. And I think that's, that's the trouble that we get into. And we focus so much on work that one of the things that we give up on is rest. I think we've heard people say that before, you know, people, I've, I've heard people say this, you know what, our rest, our, someone's working very hard, being very busy, and, this, and people are saying, hey, you've got to slow down, and this person will say, you know what, I'll rest when I'm dead. You know what, if we don't learn how to rest, we're going to be dead, all right? We're going to be dead much sooner than, than we ought to be. So we need to learn how to rest. After all, Jesus did tell us the importance of rest. And today we're going to be looking at three very simple verses, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. And here's what it says right there. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this time and we ask that your spirit will be here with us, teaching us and guiding us as we look into your word, as we receive from your spirit today. So we just ask you open up our hearts, open up our, our eyes, open up our ears, open up our entire beings, Lord, so that we'll receive from you and we'll leave this place becoming more and more like Christ. We thank you. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen. You know, we often talk about how Jesus taught many things. And one thing he often said was he did not come to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill it. And if we talk about the law, the law of God, one key aspect of the law of the Lord actually involves rest. Remember what the fourth commandment is. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one is in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, He rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. This is part of the law that God set apart for us. I mean, the Ten Commandments. Part of the Ten Commandments is this big thing about resting. Well, what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath, it comes from, I mean, the original Hebrew, it's the word Shabbat, which is literally defined as to rest, 
to stop or to cease from work. Right there, to rest, stop or cease from work. And we see how in the Old Testament, in the law, God instructs us to rest. God himself demonstrates the importance of rest. Later on in the New Testament, we read about it as well. It's still taught, the whole idea of rest is taught to us by the apostles in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 to 11. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from His. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. What it's saying right here is that God's message on rest has not changed throughout time. Whether Old Testament, New Testament, there still remains a Sabbath rest and just like God rested from His work, we too must rest. And rest is a command. To not rest is akin to disobedience. That's what it says here in Hebrews 4. And I like what it says in verse 11. It says, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. It almost seems like an oxymoron. Put in effort to rest. But that's how serious this issue on rest is to the Lord. That rest is something so important, it's so fundamental, it transcends our history, our culture, it goes beyond what, what we, we think or we know. It finally comes down to a, the way God has created things and it's a matter of obedience. It's obeying a command that comes from God. But from what we can observe in culture today, there are many people who don't make it a point to rest. Like I said earlier on, we kind of feel like working hard is a measure of success. In fact, we push ourselves to work harder and harder. We don't make it a point to rest. Sometimes we don't even want to rest and sometimes we don't know how to rest. We can't quite make sense of how it's all supposed to work and because of that, we devise this thing, this thing that we, we hear so often, especially here in Singapore. We hear about this thing we call work-life balance. And I want to talk about this again because I need to keep coming back to it so that we understand what this is all about. This thing called work-life balance. If you, I went online to try and find what is the, the definition of it. It says this, work-life balance is the division of one's time and focus between working and family or leisure activities and anything else you can think that falls in that category. So work-life balance basically is work on one side and the rest of your life on the other side. Okay, your family, leisure activities, friends, and, and so on. And I do get the idea of why this had to be developed. And while I, I appreciate the thought and sentiment behind it, I do disagree with it to a certain extent. I don't disagree with the intention behind it, but I do believe we've got the wrong idea about it. See, when we talk about work-life balance, I mean, balancing something, think of a scale, Okay. And essentially, when you say work-life balance, you're pitting work against life. That's, that's what we're doing, work against life. But that's not how it's supposed to be. It's never been supposed to be like. It's not about work versus life. See, let me explain. Work and life cannot be opposites. They are not opposites. And we need to get this idea out of, of, of our minds because it's not really about balancing work and life. The issue here is that it's about balancing work and rest, okay? And the reason why I say it cannot be a work-life balance because work is a part of life. In fact, work and rest are both subsets of this bigger thing called life. Life is so much bigger. See, when we say work-life balance, we've got this idea that there's life and then there's work. No, work is a part of life. If we look through Scripture, Scripture shows us that work is something fundamental. So the, at the end of the day, we need to balance work and rest. There must be an element of work. There must be an element of rest. And these two things are subsets of, the, of, of life. They're part of life. It's not about work-life balance. It's about balancing work and rest. So that's, that's, that's what I feel we need to understand. So maybe it's just a, a misnomer in the naming of this thing. But what we must understand is that it's not work versus life. It's work versus rest. In fact, when we finally do understand that it's about work and, 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 and rest, we see how both our work and our rest gives purpose, it gives meaning, it gives us something to look forward to in our lives. Work is not the, is not the opposite, it's not the, the, the competitor to life. No, if anything, work is part of it. And if we go back to Scripture, the Garden of Eden, there's work to be done. I believe in eternity, in, in, in all God's glory, will be, there's work that needs to be done there as well. And the issue with our culture today 
is this. The problem has never been the presence of work because that's how God created things to be. The problem has always been is, an, is the absence of rest. That is the issue. Work is not the problem. The absence of rest is the problem, which is why God Himself demonstrated to us how He had to rest, and not just that, He put it in law to tell us the importance of rest. And so today, I want to teach us the importance of rest, and we must explore why is it important to find rest. Why is it important to find rest? And what I always teach, four very important things. All right? I'll use the word rest as an acronym, R-E-S-T. Number one, why is rest? Why is finding rest so important? Firstly, because rest is about restoration. The first thing, R, restoration. Rest exists for the purpose of restoration. Now, what is restoration all about? Restoration is to return to a former condition. If we talk about our physical beings, as we go about our work, and we, as the whole day, as we go to work, go to school, go and do about, go about doing our stuff, we are basically expanding our strength. We are expanding energy. And the longer we do those things, the more we expand and the less energy and strength we have. What happens when we rest? When we rest, it le- allows us to have that strength and that energy restored. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So he says, come to me when you're weary. What does it mean when you're weary? You're weary means that you are are tired, you've lost strength, you've lost energy. And it says, now I give you rest. Right here, this is about restoration. Those who are weary, those who are burdened, they can trade that for this divine rest that comes uh, from Jesus. And that's restoration. When we sleep at night, Every, every single day when we sleep at night, our body is going through a process of restoration. Our muscles are relaxed as blood supply to them increases, tissues grow, repair in the body takes place, energy returns, growth hormones are released and, and so on. The body is basically being restored to where it needs to be, to what it needs to be. It's exchanging weariness and tiredness for freshness. And so when you have a good night's sleep, You wake up in the morning, you feel fresh, you feel ready for what you need to do because that process of restoration had taken place. In Scripture, in the Gospels, this this idea of restoration was important to Jesus. Jesus, despite doing all the things he was doing, going out, preaching the Gospel, healing the sick, and so on, he would make it a point to find time to rest. Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 31. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, Let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. Right here, when it talks about rest, rest simply means rest. Jesus was showing us the importance of going to to rest, going to get themselves restored. He realizes that they have to look after themselves. They have not even eaten. Part of part of being restored is you know on part of being of being rested is also your diet eating. You know if you expend all the energy and you don't eat, you're not going to have that process of restoration as well. So he saw the importance of this. Jesus told the disciples, "Let's go and rest." Remember, it was not the disciples who said, hey, Jesus, let's go and find some place to rest. No, it was Jesus who initiated it. And I believe that rest is something so important to God that God will always remind us the importance of rest. And sometimes if we still refuse to rest, He will make us rest. How does that happen? Well, sometimes one way that happens is that we actually do fall sick. I don't believe is that God wants to curse us with sickness, but sometimes God needs to, to, to show us in such a, uh, to shout to us basically that, hey, you need to slow down. You need to stop. Because sometimes we reach this place, right, where, where we keep writing checks that our bodies can't cash. You know? We keep, oh, I'll say, I'll, you say yes, this, I'll do this, I'll do that. But after all, we, we are so tired out, we cannot keep going and that's why we fall sick. I believe that's why sickness is a, is, is a thing. It's a reminder that, hey, you need to rest. Your body cannot keep up with this anymore. It's Charles Spurgeon who said this great statement. I love it. He says, The bow cannot be always bent without fear of breaking. Repose is as needful to the mind as sleep to the body. 
great example there of a of a of a bow and arrow. I mean, if the bow is constantly something you pull back, there's there's the risk that it's going to break, or it will come to the inevitability that it will break. And that's the truth. That we will we all have a breaking point. A point where it feels like there's so much around us we cannot manage and we'll end up breaking down physically, emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually. That's why we must rest. We must be restored. Psalm 23, verses 2 to 3. I like this. I like the New King James Version. It says, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. We talk about all this. It sounds like, you know, it's such a beautiful thing that, that God is giving us that place of rest. But maybe, maybe it's just the, the, the Singaporean and me reading it in a very singlish way. But I like that, that first three words. You know, he makes me. Okay, when we say he makes me, what does it mean? It's almost like he forces me, you know. Hey, he, he made me do that. Sometimes I think God will do that. He will make us lie down in a green pasture because rest is something so important. The very fact that he put it in his law that we are to rest is one of the ways that he's making us rest. It's so important he has to put it down in writing, in stone literally, that this is a commandment, that we must rest. But as we talk about rest, it's not just about sleeping more. It's not just about relaxing. It's about the condition of your soul. What he says right here in, in the psalm, in verse 3, he says, He restores my soul. In the end, yes, we can focus on resting physically, even emotionally and mentally, but what about spiritually? What about our souls? Are our souls restored? See, often we focus on restoring our bodies, our minds, our emotions. We try and disconnect from work as much as possible. We can take a weekend off. We can go on a vacation, whatever. But I, I'm sure it's happened before. You take all that leave, you go on a vacation, whatever. But when you get back to work, what happens? You feel that, that, you feel that, that sense of dread again. You feel like something's eating you up in your, in your stomach. You feel like you want to die again. Why? Because you can be rested in all these areas. But if your soul is not well rested, then you're still not going to completely feel rested. That's why Jesus said, come to me, I will give you rest. He didn't say sleep more, you know. He didn't say go on more vacations. Not that these things are not important, but what it says is that ultimately we must come to him. Isaiah 40 verse 31, those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. You can sleep all you want, you can relax all you want, we can go on all the vacations we want, but we'll never truly feel rested until we, we have that rest that comes from God, until He restores our soul. And like He goes on to say in Psalm 23, verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. We overflow. We, we, our cup runs over. That's what happens when our souls are restored. And so, when we talk about rest, this is the first thing I want to share with us. Why is rest so important? Because number one, rest is for the purpose of restoration. Restoration in our bodies, in our minds, in our, in our hearts, in our, our souls, our spirits, so that we receive that, that strength, that energy to go and do what we've, called, we've been called to do. And that leads me to the second important point. First one, the first reason why it's important to rest is because it's for the purpose of restoration. Number two, it's for the purpose of enablement. What is, what is enablement all about? What does it mean? Enablement is basically this. It's the process of making someone able to do something. That's what enablement means. So like I'm talking about rest, you're restored. But restored for what? You're restored not just to do anything, you're restored to fulfill a particular work, a particular job, a particular calling that we have. And so rest enables us to do that. Matthew chapter 11, verses 29 to 30. It says, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is like light. We must be mindful as we look through this, that Jesus brings up this term called yoke, all right? What is a yoke? Yoke is basically something that represents uh, uh, work. It's a tool used for work, especially for, for tending to, to uh, crops that you have. And I'll show you another picture here uh, that sometimes is attached to a uh, bull like that. And it's used, to, you know, for the plow to go there and, 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 and do what they need to do with the ground. Yoke is always 
It has, the, it has the significance of representing work. And the very fact that Jesus says, take my yoke, Jesus didn't say, come to me and I will take off your yoke. He didn't say, come to me and there'll be no more work or whatever. Instead, he says, come to me, but I will give you my yoke. I will place my yoke upon you. My yoke, yes, it is easier. Yes, it's lighter, but yet it is still meant for work. And so in Matthew 11, Jesus was basically saying that the yoke placed upon the people by the Pharisees was something heavy, but his yoke is different. See, what had happened was that there were these people, the Pharisees, the religious leaders at that point of time, the way they were treating the people and their understanding of the law, particularly about the law, about the Sabbath, it was all, all wrong. Okay? They, would, they would enforce the Sabbath. Yes, people must rest, but they became so legalistic in their enforcement of of, um, of this law that they were supposed to rest so that on the Sabbath day, they would actually give the people a number of steps they can walk in that day. And they would count. They would actually go and count the people on how many steps they, they make. And if they take more steps than that, then they're going to be punished. And they, they basically had this messed up idea. And that's why when you go through the Gospels, you will hear about the Pharisees kind of debating or challenging Jesus Christ on the laws of the Sabbath. One example is in the next chapter, Matthew chapter 12. Verses 9 to 12, it says, Jesus then went over to the synagogue where he noticed a man with a deformed hand. The Pharisees asked Jesus, does the law then permit a person to work by healing people on the Sabbath? And they were hoping he would say yes so that they could charge him again for breaking the Sabbath. Verse 11, Jesus answered, if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. And how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. The Pharisees were not very happy to hear this, and later on, they, over this, they plotted to kill him. But the point here was Jesus was trying to point out that, hey, you guys got the whole understanding wrong. And in another account, in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 2, verse 27, he says this, this powerful line, this powerful statement here. Jesus said to these Pharisees, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. See, he was bringing back, them back to the first principle. If we're more familiar with other translations, this is where Jesus says the, um, uh, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And right here it explains in the New Living Translation, it says the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people. This is coming back to the first principle where God didn't put this law in just for fun. That you're better rest. If you don't rest, I'm going to be angry at you. No, that's not, that's not what it was. God knows we need rest. We need restoration. We need to be able to do what we've, we've been called to do. And so he instituted the Sabbath and it was made to meet the needs of the people and not the other way round. See, he knows that we must be, we, as we rest, we are restored. As we are restored, we're enabled right now because of that strength and the energy we have again. We are enabled to go and do what we've been called to do, whether it's going to school, going about serving our family, going to about to our jobs, our work, serving in the ministry, whatever it is. See, that's why rest is so important because rest actually enables us to do what we need to do. Again, Charles Spurgeon, he taught a lot about rest. He says this, rest time, contrary to belief, is not waste time. It is economy to gather fresh strength. It is wisdom to take the occasional furlough. In the long run, we shall do more by sometimes doing less. Rest, rest time is not waste time. A lot of people think that rest time is, is, is waste time. No, it's not. It is important. I, I love the phrase he uses. He says it's a matter of economy. It is e it's a matter of economy to, for us to generate this thing called strength, called energy, so that we can do what we want to do. And if we don't rest, then we're not going to be able to do all these things. Think about it. When It's only when we have sufficient rest, then we know we can produce good work or better work when we've slept only two hours or one hour and, or we didn't sleep at all and we go to office for a full day of work or we go for a full day of manual labor or, or, or go to school and all that, will we be able to produce our best work? Definitely not. We can't produce our best work because we're not in that right state of mind or physical condition because we're tired, we're exhausted. It's, it's like our, our mobile phones. Every day, we all have our mobile phones with us okay, in this day and age. And what do we do at the end of the day? In fact, nowadays it's not even at the end of the day. We're charging our phones through the day. 
But at the end of the day, before we go to bed, we set our million alarms and, and, and all that. What do we finally do before we sleep? We, we make sure our phones are plugged in. Why do we make sure our phones are plugged in? So that our phones can be charged up and when we wake up the next day, we can go about doing whatever it is we needed to do with our, our phones. Okay, We don't charge our phones overnight so that the next day we can wake up, take it out, switch it off and put it in a drawer. No, we want it to be fully charged because we've got a purpose for it. We want, it, we want, it to, we want to enable it to fulfill our needs for the next day whether it's I check my email or log on to social media or watch a video or do whatever it is or our alarm clock or whatever it is, we charge it up so that it can be enabled to fulfill its purposes. If this phone has no purpose for our day, if we don't need this phone and, and this phone is just going to be chucked aside, we're not going to charge it. I'm sure some of us, we've got more than one phone. You know, you've got an old phone that you don't use anymore, an old device. You don't, you don't keep, if you don't use that device anymore, you don't keep it charged up anymore, do you? When was the last time you put out all your old phones, okay, that, that you, for, for some reason, didn't sell, didn't get rid of it, and you keep them all charged at 100% all the time? We don't do that. You don't charge something that has no purpose, that has no use to you anymore. Same thing for our lives. The reason why we must rest, we must be charged up again, is because we have a purpose. We must be enabled to do that work that God has called us to do. See, what gives rest meaning is actually work. Work gives rest meaning. If there was no work to be done, then what is the point of resting? Then this rest is basically meaningless. So that's why the second thing I want to talk about is enablement, where rest is important because it enables us to do the work that we are supposed to already have been doing. So why is it important to find rest? Number one, because rest is about restoration. Number two, because rest is about enablement and because that we can do what we are called to do. Number three, S. Rest is given to us for the purpose of satisfaction as well. Resting brings us satisfaction. What is satisfaction? Satisfaction is pleasure that is derived from the fulfillment of one's expectations. You know, because we are restored, we are therefore enabled to do what we need to do. And once we complete doing what we actually have to do, there's a certain sense of satisfaction right there. I think that's, that is, is, is having, looking at what we've done, there must be that sense of satisfaction right there. God wants us to learn how to rest so that we can learn how to be satisfied. Resting is not just about sleeping, you know. Resting can just be sitting back, relaxing, doing something, or admiring what you have done as well. You know, it's easy to find, thing, find satisfaction in things you already consider pleasurable. Like, it's easy to find satisfaction in going on a vacation. But how about finding satisfaction in our work? And some people might be like, well, how, how is that possible? I can never derive pleasure from that work. And that's why we struggle with work, because we don't find satisfaction in this. And the thing is this, if we are not satisfied in life, we will, if there's things that's causing us to be dissatisfied, then we'll never actually really be rested. We need to work hard so that we can enjoy and be satisfied in our rest. I'm not sure if, if you've encountered this before, where you're given a certain task to do, whether it's for your work, for school, at home, in a ministry, anywhere it is. You're given a certain task to do, and you put in a lot of effort. You, you wanted to give your best, and you, you, everything you've done, you did it well, you did it diligently, and the, the result was something so exceptional. It was so great. And when you look at it, and seeing it used by the people around you, seeing it blessing people around you, there's a sense of satisfaction. When you stand back and you look at what you've created, what you've done, you get that sense of satisfaction. See, we do get a sense of satisfaction at our work that is done well. But when our work is not done well, it will never bring us satisfaction. It will never make us feel happy when we, when we look at it. And I feel that this whole concept here is actually something that comes from God himself. Remember, God wants, to, wants us to follow his example. And if we go to the creation account, we hear about God resting and being satisfied in all that he had done. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and then we move on to chapter 2 all the way to verse 3. It says, 
God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work on, of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. What does it say there? It says, God finished his work. He looks at what he had created and he says, it was very good. It's he was satisfied in what he had created right there. He was very satisfied. And because that work was done well, it was very good. He was so pleased in it. It brings that sense of satisfaction. And when we find that sense of satisfaction, we enjoy that rest. If we're not satisfied in it, we're going to continue to, to, to be, and we'll have this sense of, well, restlessness because our work was not done in a satisfied way manner. It was um, Elizabeth Elliot. She's the wife of uh, Jim Elliot, the, uh, the very well-known missionary. Uh, she says this, work is a blessing. God has so arranged the world that work is necessary and he gives us hands and strength to do it. The enjoyment of leisure would be nothing if we had only leisure. It is the joy of work well done that enables us to enjoy rest, just as it is the experiences of hunger and thirst that make food and drink such pleasures. Beautiful statement. I mean, I, could, I couldn't, why I put it here is because I couldn't put it better myself. The enjoyment of leisure will be nothing if we only had leisure. If, if everything is just about rest, just about relaxation, then there's nothing to enjoy. But it's the joy of doing our work well, putting all that hard work, that hard effort, and it pays off and we have that sense of satisfaction, then we truly move one step closer to what that sense of rest is. And when we have that satisfaction, we are able to move to true rest because we feel rested in our hearts rather than restless. When we didn't do something well, we didn't do something in the best of our abilities, we get a sense of restlessness. What if I could have done something better? What if I could have done, Or what if this thing's going to fail? What if it's not going to work out? That restlessness comes in. The anxiety comes in. But true restedness comes in when there's satisfaction. Psalm 23 verse 1, it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. It's not about abundance. It's not about having everything. This is about being satisfied. That I lack nothing. I look at my life, I lack, I lack nothing. All the work that I've done, I, because I'm satisfied, I can truly enter into God's rest. And today, we must learn to, that rest involves work. And when we put that hard work into action, it results in something good then we find that satisfaction. And with that satisfaction, we can actually become rested. So these are the first three things. We're going to come to the fourth thing. So what are the first three things I've covered? Okay, why is it important for us to find rest? Because rest exists for the purpose of, firstly, restoration, meaning that we are, we are restored. We get back our energy. We get back our strength. Number two is for the purpose of enablement. It means now that we have our strength, now that we have our energy, we are enabled to go and do what it is we're supposed to do. Number three, after we talk about satisfaction. After we've done what we've done well, we put in that hard work, that effort, we find a sense of satisfaction in the work we've done, we can now come to the final thing, the fourth thing. R-E-S-T, the last one. Why is it important for us to find rest? Because rest ultimately exists for the purpose of learning trust. Trust. Learning to rest, learning to find rest is an act of trust. Trusting God. And sometimes the reason why we feel restless, we cannot actually truly rest, is because we have trust issues. Maybe we don't really trust God or we don't really trust our circumstances. And therefore, we are in this constant state of striving for the things that we want. And that's why we have this need in life to must keep being busy, to keep doing more and more things. And as a result, we cannot find that rest. But Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus started out saying, with, started out with these powerful words. He says, Come to me. The point here is this. He's saying that you talk about this whole issue of rest, it comes back to God. It comes back to our Lord. It calls us to go back to Jesus and to trust in Him. This statement here, come to me, this is a statement of trust, you know. If we don't trust Him, 
we won't go to him. We will only go to we only go to him if we trust in him. So this is a matter of trust. There was this one instance where the the where Jesus was out with the disciples, and we see how Jesus demonstrates what it means to find rest because of this immense trust that he has towards his heavenly Father. Mark chapter four verses thirty six to forty. The disciples, the people, they took Jesus in the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind. But soon a fierce storm came up and high waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? We look through this whole example here and we've seen it many times. We see a clear picture being painted. When the storm came, Jesus was at complete rest while the disciples were completely restless. Okay, just the, the, the juxtaposition here is this. Why would I say Jesus was at complete rest? It's so interesting. Of all the examples that they, they use, uh, that of what could happen there, Jesus was asleep on a pillow, on a cushion. It was not that Jesus was relaxing somewhere. He was, he was seated or he was reclining, but he was awake. No, he was asleep. Sleeping is the most universally understood idea of how rest looks like, one of the aspects of rest. So the fact that he was sleeping through the storm, we see how he was at complete rest. The disciples, on the other hand, they were panicking. They were running. The fact that they went up to him and shouted, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Which I've always said, I felt it's, it's such an accusatory kind of thing to say, you know. that Jesus, you don't care that we're going to drown. It shows that sense of restlessness, of anxiety, of how panicky they were, how they were worrying for, for their lives. But right there, Jesus Christ knew that his life was not in the hands of the storm. His life was not in the hands of the disciples. His hands were not in the life of anything that was around them. His life was in the hands of God. And that's why at the end of that passage, when he finally challenges the disciples, he says, why are you afraid? Why do you still have no faith? See, it comes into a matter of trust. That was the important lesson right there. And the fact that they said, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? all the more shows that there was a lack of trust in that situation. So, the question is then, are we willing to trust in God and rest, even when we're headed toward a storm or we're already in that storm? Or are we just trying to strive and work harder to make sure that we get out of this storm or we try and fix things in our own way? And sometimes we do that, we get caught up in all that. So do we get end up becoming busier and busier? Or are we willing to say, God, I'm going to rest. I am going to learn to rest because I trust in you. Do we dare to trust that God is in control? Do we dare to believe that even if things aren't seemingly going according to plan, that God is actually closing doors that ought to remain shut so that we can enter through doors that are open for us through His divine opportunities? See, we must learn to have that trust. But I believe sometimes we don't, we don't trust in God. We must learn to trust that God teaches us to rest. Yes, I'm not saying that we be irresponsible and we don't do the things that we're called to do. But sometimes in these moments of crisis, we end up working harder pushing ourselves even further. And the more we push ourselves, we, we, we reach that place of, of burnout. But do we dare to say, I know everything is not going according to plan. There's a bit of messiness right now, but God, your command is to rest. I'm not going to rest throughout the whole thing, but I'll learn to put my trust in you. And if you call me to rest right now, I'm going to rest. I'm going to step back. I'm going to leave this in your hands. If we dare to do that, then I believe we are one step closer to finding that aspect of rest. Today, maybe Jesus is saying that to us, you know, come to me, come to me. But some of us, we're stuck. Why? Because we're like the disciples. We're going through all these crazy things. We're trying to fix things. And, and we're like, like, Jesus, hear my prayers. I'm in trouble. I need to fix this. I'm trying to do all these kind of things. And Jesus is saying, come to me. 
but we're still caught up doing all these kind of things, trying to fix all the different things. They say, I, I, Jesus, I can't because I need to deal with all these things. Do you not see all these things happening? But Jesus says, come to me. And to do that, to put down those things means that you need to learn to trust in God. And if we don't learn to trust in Him, like I said, we're never really going to learn what it means to really be at rest. Today, it's time for us to learn to trust God. It's time to get comfortable in that storm, knowing that God is in control. Yes, we have things to do. We are called to work. We are called to fulfill things. But we must learn to trust in the Lord. And when He calls us to rest, we can be at peace knowing that He is in charge. We can be just like Jesus in that, in that storm where He has that pillow and He is resting in it. Today, we must learn to trust Him. And just like it says in Psalm 23 verse 4, Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they protect and they comfort me. The only way we're going to know that He is close beside us, the only way we're going to experience how His rod and His staff protects and comforts us is when we learn to trust in Him. Because when we're busy trying to fix things ourselves, then what's going to happen? It is not His staff that is protecting and comforting us. It is our own hands, our own work that is trying to bring about that solution. But no, if we want to rest, we must learn to trust in God. So today, these are the four things I want to share with us on why is it important for us to find rest in our daily lives. Because number one, it's for the purpose of restoration. That means that we get our strength and our, our energy back. Number two, we, are, we get that strength and energy so that we're enabled to do what God has called us to do, to do what we need to do in our workplace, in our schools, in our families, and so on. Number three, we rest so that we can learn how to be satisfied in the work that we have done. That we put in all this time and energy and hard work in something done well and we can sit back just like God did and look at it and find satisfaction in that. That brings us to that sense of restedness. But finally, the most important of all is that rest is a demonstration of our trust. If we truly trust in the Lord, we can find that rest in Him. When we are rest, when we, and on a regular basis, on a daily basis, when we are restored, when we're enabled, when we're satisfied, when we live in trust, then we'll finally learn and experience what restedness is in our spirits. And today, I hope we've captured the importance of rest. And as I share this word, what I really want for us is to commit ourselves to this idea of, well, I guess we can call it work-rest balance. To making sure that, there's, that we work and we rest in our lives. Now, when I say that, let's not get, sometimes we get calculated, you know, how much do we work, how much do we rest? It's not necessarily a 50-50 kind of thing. Um, and sometimes, I know people don't want to talk about this because people get the idea that, oh, everything's just about rest and we rest all the time. Well, life has both work and rest and if you want to follow God's model, okay, God did both, He worked and rested, but He worked six days, He only rested one day. Okay, so that's the ratio that we're looking at. It's not necessarily 50-50. But the point I'm getting here, getting at is this, that, that, that life involves both work and rest. It's not one or the other. We must have, it's a both and kind of situation. If we go back to the beginning, the creation, when God created everything in six days and then He took that day of rest, did we ever wonder what happened on that final day of rest? Does it mean that on that, on that Sabbath, does, did God cease to exist that day? He, was, was, was it that on that one day, if anybody prays, God is out, Okay, there's, there's, this is his vacancy that he's not there. Or if it, it's, no, that's not what happened. The entire universe didn't stop functioning that day that God took rest. You know, God was still God. He was the same God uh, um, that he has always been. Just like how when the Pharisees confronted Jesus on the issue, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? The point here is that there's both work and there's rest. And rest doesn't negate work Neither does work negate the importance of rest. In fact, 
work gives our rest purpose. And rest gives our work purpose as well. They empower one another as a matter of fact. And so we need to get out of this do, do, do attitude. Not that it's wrong to be wanting to do things, but if that's all we, how we think, all just work, 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 then that's not how God intended us to live. There is work and there is rest. And I've always said this one thing. I've said it many times to, to our staff team here as well. Sometimes we get we don't want to talk about rest because it feels like a taboo thing. That when we talk about rest, it'll give way to I don't know laziness or whatever. But no rest is something that God wants to talk about. And I always say this to our staff team, which is this: rest is not just inactivity. An activity is not necessarily productivity. And so we need to be very mindful of how we live our lives. Rest is not just about. Oh, I switch off and I never do anything. Neither is life just about work and work and work and I do everything. I don't f- focus on rest. No, there must be the important bit of both. And I want to close off, bring us back to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1, which we're told, Therefore, since the promise of entering His rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. What's, this, what's, what's being said here basically is, let us be mindful not to be found to be disobeying God's command when it comes to rest. That, that we are, that we are called, we are instructed to rest. Let us not fall short of this. And today really, this message is for everyone, whether we know Jesus or not, He's calling us, He's saying, come to me. I know you are weary. I know you are heavy laden. But I want to give you that rest. You know, one reason why we have this sense of restlessness in our lives or in our spirits is really because of sin. See, when you are restless, it means that we are not at peace. We are, there's a certain anxiety and our spirits are not at peace. Why? Because sin, sin makes us enemies with God. Now what is sin? Sin is basically us rejecting God's ways and wanting to do things according to our own uh, desires and the Bible says that all of us have sinned and we have fall short of God's standard and because of that sin, we always want to do things our own way. It it brings about this this loss of, of, of peace because sin separates us from God. If we go back to the beginning, since we talked about that a little bit today, uh, when God created humanity, He created Adam and Eve and they were living in His presence in the Garden of Eden, when they fell into sin, what happened? Sin created a barrier between them and God. Before God even cast them out of the Garden of Eden, remember, Adam and Eve felt the need to hide away from God because they felt ashamed. There was a distancing between them. And finally, they could not be allowed to remain with their sin in the Garden of Eden because God's glory would cause them to be destroyed. So He didn't want to have to destroy them. He put them outside of the Garden of Eden so that they will live, so that they can survive and so that He can, and God can continue to reach out to them. And if you look through all history ever since there was that, people have tried to make peace with God or make peace with the heavens or their souls or whatever by, doing, by striving and doing all kinds of good things in, in life. We try to give more to charities. We try to, to do more good works. We try to be nice to people. We, and we, we think that all these things, will, all this kind of striving in this sense will help us attain what we've lost. But that's not how it works. That's not how it works. We can do all that we still find that our hearts have this lack of peace. There's this restlessness in our spirit still. You know why? Because our spirits were not created to be apart, uh, away from God. And so that's why God sent His Son Jesus to die for our sins, to remove that sin, to remove that thing that that was separating us from God. So the Bible tells us in John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world through Him may be saved. Today, 
God is calling out to those of us who have never responded to the gospel before. He says He knows, He sees that, that, that burden, that weariness, that tiredness, that restlessness, that, that, that lack of peace that is within you. And He says, you know what, you can strive to try and deal with all these things. We can try and do all the different things in this world to try and, and, and fill that void. Nothing is ever going to fill that void because only God can. It's like we often say, we all have a God-shaped hole in our hearts. Only God can fill that hole. Only God can restore us and make us whole in the way we were created to be. And today, I, I know that some of you, you, you've never responded to the gospel before. You've never acknowledged Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. But today, I want you to know that this is your opportunity to do so. You're hearing this message about rest and, and you say you want this because you feel that tremendous sense of restlessness. You feel that no matter what you do, you, you, you're never at peace. There's always something that's causing you to be anxious. There's always something to, to there's always some problem that is around you. But today, the Lord says He wants to give you that peace. He wants to give you that rest. We're not saying that today you respond to Him and all these problems will go. In fact, what will happen is that all these problems may still be there, but despite them, you can find that peace. You can find that rest. You can learn to trust in Him in the worst of storms in your life. And you will experience and know that He is a good God who loves you, who is with you every step of the way, how He loves us so much that He sent His Son Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. When Jesus died on that cross, He took away our sins by literally taking all our sins upon Himself. He took the punishment for our sins and He experienced true separation from God. While the rest of us, we were reconciled to God and we can now walk hand in hand with Him in His presence. If you've never responded to the gospel before, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. In a moment's time, we're going to pray and as, as we pray, this is a prayer I want you to respond with. I'll say this prayer out loud and I want you to pray along with me out loud as well. I'll say it line by line. You follow after me line by line. Say everything I say word for word. And all the Christians here, let's pray as well so that we can rededicate our lives and also, you know, so that no one is praying this alone in this very moment. But today, you've never given your life to the Lord before. You've never responded to the gospel. You've never acknowledged Him as your Lord and Saviour. This is the moment. Don't let this moment pass you by right now. It is no coincidence you're here. God is calling out to you. Maybe today you feel like you don't have that faith to respond. You know what? The Bible tells us all we need is faith as that of a mustard seed. A mustard seed is a tiny seed. It's the tiniest seed in a, in a whole garden. And what, the, what God wants us to know is this. Don't focus on the faith you don't have. Use the faith that you do have, even if it's so tiny. Right now, I know you know something is stirring up in your heart. Respond. So I'm going to invite all of us right now. Can we close our eyes and bow our heads wherever we are? Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. And in a moment's time, I'm going to begin praying. And as I pray, the Christians, you're going to pray along as well, but the rest of you who have never acknowledged Jesus as your Lord and Saviour today and right now you know this moment, you need to respond, I want you to pray along with me. So if our heads bow and our eyes closed, come and pray along with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your great love for me that you would send your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. God, today, I open up my heart to you. I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your peace. I receive your rest. Lord Jesus, today, I ask that you forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Restore me and make me righteous. I open up my heart to you and I declare that you are my Lord and you are my Saviour and I want to follow you all the days of my life. Thank you, Jesus. With our heads bowed and our eyes still closed, I believe that those of us who prayed this prayer for the first time today, and if that's you, here's what I'm going to do. In a moment's time, I'm going to count to three. And the moment I say three, 
if you pray along with me for the first time just now, I want you to now say a very simple prayer. I'm not going to lead you in this prayer. You're going to pray it yourself, but I'll give you the words to say. I'm going to give it to you right now. You're going to just say this very simple prayer, five words. These five words are, God, reveal yourself to me. God, reveal yourself to me. I want you to say these words by yourself, and then after that, I'm going to pray over you. And I want you to say this prayer yourself because I want you to experience for yourself that God is real and He hears your prayers. And as you make that prayer, He's going to reveal Himself to you in such a real and tangible way. Wherever you are, whether tonight, tomorrow, in the coming week, but God is going to speak to you in such a real way. So don't let this moment pass you by. I'm going to count to three. At the count of three, you say these five words, God, reveal yourself to me. Even if just now you didn't pray along with me in the previous prayer, but right now you know you must respond. Then in the count of three, say these words. I'm going to count right now. And you say those words, God, reveal yourself to me. One, two, and three. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we're just so thankful for all our friends who have responded today. And wherever they are, we, Lord, we want to bless them right now that they will know the truth that comes from you, that, that they can be strong, they can be courageous because you are with them and you will never leave them, you will never forsake them. And Lord, I'm just so thankful that as they respond to your word today, that as they return to you, Lord, you will give them rest. You will give them that peace in their hearts as they learn to trust you each and every day. So to all our friends, we ask that the Lord will bless you in all that you do, in your studies, in your work, in your relationships with your friends, in your family, in your health, in everything that you do. May you know that God is with you every step of the way. We pray all this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, we can look up at the screen right now. And I'm just so happy for all our friends who responded today. Really, this is such, such an amazing day. And you know what? This is a new beginning for you. It doesn't mark the end but it marks a brand new journey that you're going to be on. And for, for all of you, I just want to say this. We often say that as you respond, you are now like a spiritual baby. And we say that because, you know, nobody takes a baby and chucks it aside. A baby needs a family and a community to help it grow and journey through life. And for you, you need a spiritual family and a community to journey together with you. And we would like to be this community. And so if you responded in any way just now, we want you to head over to this website on the screen, fcbc.org.sg slash connect with us because we're serious about being this family and this community to you. So head over there to connect with us and even if just now you didn't respond in any way but right now you know you, you need to, go over there and respond and we're going to get connected with you because like I said, we're serious about being that family. So we're so happy for you. We're, we're so thankful uh, uh, for you being here and responding. We're just, we're just so happy for you. Well, for the rest of us as we close off this Time. We're going to close off responding to the Lord. And today, I think it's very simple. I just feel the Lord saying that there's some of us, we are feeling restless because we've not learned to trust in the Lord. And it's interesting, you know, we hear a message like that. How do we respond? Oh God, help me feel rested. I don't think that's it. I think the way we respond today is we need to respond and say, God, I want to trust you. And maybe some of us, we struggle to say that. Then we say, Lord, give me the strength to trust you. Teach me to trust you. Help me learn what it means to put my trust in you in every situation. Maybe that's how many, I believe many of us, we need to respond in that way. You may be feeling just so tired or weary or burdened by whatever it is. Today, just lay it down at the foot of the cross and say, God, I entrust this to you. Last week we talked about how you're feeling. Maybe you've got this lack of peace, you've got this burden, you've got this restlessness. Today, come and lay it all down before the Lord. And as always, if you need someone to pray for you, get in contact with your cell group uh, and people will be happy to pray for you. If you're in a live chat, people will be more than happy to, to pray over you as well. But today, let's really come and encounter God. Because there's only so much more I can say. At the end of the day, Scripture says, we must, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. So it's not about me, Pastor Daniel, what I can say here today. It's about us returning to Jesus, trusting Him. That's when we'll get that real rest, that real 
peace. Maybe some of us, the question we're going to explore is, how do I need to change my life today? Because some of us, maybe we know that we've not been making it a point to rest. We're not committed to resting. Well, maybe we need to say, Lord, I want to learn to rest in your arms. I want to learn to rest in your presence so that I can be enabled and empowered to go out and do what you've called me to do. So whatever it is, as we worship the Lord, this is a time for us to return to Jesus. And as we do so, I know the Lord's going to touch us. He's going to minister to us in such a special way. So let's, let's worship the Lord wherever we are. Guide me now under your wings and cover Oceans rise and thunders roar. Yeah, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood, and I will be still.
if you're going through some ministry, someone's praying for you, just allow that to happen. But in this moment right now, what are the rest of us? Let's lift up our hands to the Lord. And as we lift up our hands, it's like us coming before Him, saying, Lord, here I am. Because today Jesus says this to all of us, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Lord, I bless everybody watching this message. And I ask that we will learn to trust in you, that when we struggle, we will approach you, knowing that we have full access to you, And we can come before you with all our weariness, with all our heavy burdens, and all these can be traded in for your spirit of joy, for your spirit of peace, for the rest that comes from you and you alone. Lord, may we have the strength, may we have the courage to trust in you in every single situation. And as we do that, may we live lives that are truly at peace, there are lives that have truly rested. Lord, we thank you for this time. And I bless each and every one of you watching this with rest, true rest that comes from God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, well, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. I'm sure that you guys were blessed. So have a great week ahead and we'll catch you next week as we continue on this topic and we talk about how we can find this rest. So God bless you and we'll catch you next weekend.